is an unspoiled network podcast. This is unspoiled. This is Spoil Me, covering Siege and Storm, chapters 13, 14, and 15. In these chapters, we finally find out what happened to Bagra. I thought the Darkling had killed her. It's sort of worse than that. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Joanna for commissioning this episode. So yeah, these chapters, guys, uh, I gotta tell y'all, I'm pretty excited about where things are going here. And I want to see. Uh, Let's just start at the beginning of the story, or this section. Chapter 13. I love this. Tolia and uh, Alina are walking together and he has a weird expression on his face and she's like, what's up with you? And he says, it smells like weakness here, like people getting soft. And she sort of tries to joke around and be like, yeah, well, everybody is soft when they're compared to you. And Tamar who Alina is expecting to join in in the joke stops and says, he's right. This place feels like it's dying. And that really is sort of an interesting vibe that I like. We get verbal description of from people because I don't know how you get that across when Uh, when nothing physical about a place has really necessarily changed, you know, it's one thing to be able to be like, Oh, some place has fallen into disrepair. Some place seems to just not, people don't seem to be putting the same level of care into it as they have, but that's not what this is. They're talking about. And I find that really interesting. Um, so, Alina is realizing that the stab of anger that she felt towards the king in the throne room was rather out of proportion to what was going on at the time. She's like, yeah, he's a disgusting piece of shit, no doubt. But nevertheless, that was pretty extreme, what I was feeling there. That's weird. And we'll wind up seeing pretty shortly again what's happening there. Uh, She is losing control over her temper a little bit. So they walk out in front of the little palace and Alina realizes that it is something that she has missed and kind of feels like home to her. And she is a little bit thrown off at that. She didn't really expect that kind of feeling in response to it. And it takes her by surprise a bit. Um, so <laughs> they go inside to the, in, uh, of the golden dome and all of the Grisha are waiting here and she has to speak to them. Um, she s- sees that the ones that are here are pretty young Many of the older and more experienced Grisha had chosen to defect to the Darkling, or maybe they'd just been wise enough to run. I had anticipated that not many Corporalki would remain. They'd been the highest ranking Grisha, the most valued fighters, and closest to the Darkling. There were still several familiar faces. Sergei was one of the few heartrenders who had decided to stay. Marie and Nadia stood with the Etherealki. There it goes. Um, I'd, I was surprised to see David slouching in his seat at the materialki table. 
I knew he'd had qualms about the Darkling, but that hadn't stopped him from sealing the stag's collar around my neck. Maybe that's why he wouldn't look at me. Or maybe he was just eager to get back to his workshop. And Sergei comes forward and calls her by her name and welcomes her back, but does not bow. And there's this sort of moment where everybody's waiting to see how she behaves in reaction to him. Um, And she says that she's thinking about shattering this tension by smiling and laughing and embracing Marie and Nadia, as she puts it, pretend that she's one of them, even though she never really belonged and make a decent show of it. But she decides that she's not going to do that. And what she thinks of in order to keep herself from doing that was I remembered Nikolai's warnings and restrained myself. Weakness is a guise. Now, I'm not totally clear on that. I don't know if the smile, laugh, embracing is meant like how exactly that comes across as weakness. Maybe she thinks that's trying too hard to like pretend and then and everybody will see through it. And that's what's weak, I guess. I don't know. That one just didn't quite make a ton of sense to me. Um, and he says, it, it said you arrived in the company of the king's second son. That's right, I said pleasantly. He aided in my battle with the Darkling. On the fold? On the true sea, I corrected. A murmur rose from the crowd. I held up my hand, and to my relief, they fell silent. Get them to follow the little orders, and they'll follow the big ones. I like that moment. Um, and so she says... I've come to Osalta with a purpose. And Sergei's like, oh, yeah, getting married. And she's like, no, Jesus Christ. And then says she's returned to lead the second army. And there's a strong reaction to that. Not everybody is against her, but it doesn't feel like everybody's near unified at all. And Sergei says, you are not qualified. And she's like, Oh, I may not be, but I have the king's blessing. So that's that. And he says that they will petition the king because the corporalki are the highest ranking and should lead them. And all of a sudden, someone cuts in saying, according to you, blood letter. As soon as I heard that silky voice, I knew who it belonged to. But my heart still lurched when I caught sight of her raven's wing hair. Zoya stepped through the crowd of Ethereality, her lithe form swathed in blue summer silk that made her eyes glow like gems, disgustingly long-lashed gems. And she is continually jealous of Zoya throughout this section. This is the first instance where they've run across Zoya with Mal, and she has, like, thought about the fact that he was entranced by her right away. And there have been a couple more times um, later on where they're like seated near each other. And Alina's either thinking, Oh, he's, uh, he, I, I, I bet he's like staring at her. I bet he's really loving this. And then she'll look and she'll realize he's not. And then she turns it into, well, I don't know if it's just my imagination, but he seems to be trying a lot to not look at her. It seems to really be costing him a huge effort. And I really like that later on, Nikolai says that for a couple who are like supposedly so in love, you guys are really uh, insecure because like, honestly, what more does Mal have to do, girl? Like, it's fine in terms of... Mal is always jealous, so I kind of feel like it's fair that she also be put in the position and not be entirely sure of herself to make her feel more human and make this feel like, you know, she's still actually interested in Mal and that he isn't just, he hasn't just fallen to the background for her, you know, but it does make me laugh that no matter what Mal does, she's assigning some sort of like sub 
uh, subtext to it, you know? So Zoya says, I speak for the Ethereality and we f- will follow the Sun Summoner. But Marie piped up and says, said, not all of us. And Marie was like one of her only kind of friends. So it does sort of like bother Alina a little bit. And Zoya says, Yes, we know you support Sergei in all his endeavors, Marie, but this isn't a late night tryst by the Banya. We're talking about the future of the Grisha and all of Ravka. And honestly, good for you, Zoya. I love her. <laughs> um, so then... Sergey, no, not Sergey, an Ethereelnik who I don't think that we know his name, basically stands up and says she doesn't even go here. And I cackled. She wasn't even raised here. That's right, called out a Koporalnik. She's been a Grisha less than a year. Toy- Tolia says Grishas are born, not made. And everybody's like, oh, word, who the fuck are you again? I'm sorry. And he says that he was raised far from this corpse of a palace and is happy to prove that he can stop Sergei's heart. And this is an interesting moment because I forget that they all assume any Grisha out there have been conscripted. So the idea that these people who aren't part of this, you know, have abilities and are as old as they are, just takes them all by surprise. Um, so the corporal Nick, a different one gets to his feet and says, you're just one more coward who fled when the darkling fell. You have no right to come here and insult us. And how do we know she isn't working with him? And she shared his bed, shouted another. So they ask, what was your, what is your relationship with Nikolai? What was your relationship with the darkling? And Alina is trying to be cool and rise above in the way that Nikolai suggested, not to deny, not to deign to even acknowledge. They continue with this. You don't have a right to question her. Why? Because she's a living saint. Put her in the chapel where she belongs. Everybody starts to really get agitated. Get her and the rabble out of the little palace. Tolia reached for his sword. Tamar and Sergei both raised their hands. I saw Marie draw her flint, felt the swirl of summoner winds lift the edges of my kefta. I looked at Sergei's sneering face, and my power rose up with clear and vicious purpose. I raised my arm. If they needed a lesson, I would give it to them. They could argue over the pieces of Sergei's body. My hand arced through the air slicing toward him. The light was a blade honed sharp by my fury. At the last second, some sliver of sanity pierced the buzzing haze of my anger. No, I thought in terror as I realized what I was about to do. My panicked mind reeled. I swerved and threw the cut high. A resounding crack shook the room. The Grisha screamed and backed away, crowding against the walls. Daylight poured in through a jagged fissure above us. I'd split the golden dome open like a giant egg. And Alina is totally shook by what she just did. And she controls it and says, you think the Darkling is powerful? You have no idea what he is capable of. Only I have seen what he can do. Only I have faced him and lived to tell about it. I don't care if you think I'm a saint or a fool or the Darkling's whore. If you want to remain at the Little Palace, you will follow me. And if you don't like it, you will be gone by tonight, or I will have you in chains. I am a soldier. I am the sun summoner, and I'm the only chance you have. And I was like, Woo! Honestly, 
Thank you, Alina. Thank you. This is exactly what the fuck was called for. She needed to make a major show. She needed to prove to all of them that she is at least a little ruthless, that she has huge power at her disposal, that her power is like nothing they have, and that she's not tolerating this kind of shit. She's not going to spend all day arguing. She will tell you what's happening because that's what you need. A leader needs to be decisive and they can take their time on making those decisions to a point. But there is nothing worse than those of you who, uh, you know, have worked in management. You know, if somebody if somebody asks a superior for their answer on something and the superior is waffling on what to tell them and tell somebody else something slightly different, that stuff starts to add up and just wear away at the trust a team has that that person's ever even being honest or taking shit seriously. Telling them all, you either follow me or you're out of here. I mean, that's reasonable. This is a fucking, this is not meant to be a democracy. This is going to be an army. You cannot have dissenting opinions fucking hanging around, muddying everything up. Um, so she goes back to her room and Mal is like, did you mean to do that? And she says, not exactly, but she does not tell him what really was happening there. It seems to me like she sort of tried to frame it like she just lost control of her her power for a minute. But she doesn't say to him like, oh, yeah, I realized killing Sergei was probably a bad idea. I have to wonder what would have happened if she did kill Sergei. Honestly, part of me feels like she might have earned even more respect with that. But obviously, then she'd have his essentially innocent blood on her hands. So, you know, it would probably, it might make them think that she was actually working with the Darkling after all. Maybe it would have gone against her. I don't know. Um, And she says something about what are we going to do when it rains? And I'm like, you guys have a ton of fabricators, don't you? Like, can't they fix that? I thought. But I don't know. Maybe it's not something that can be repaired that easily. Um, so a servant comes and asks her if she's going to sleep in the Darkling's chambers. And it's a rather grim room. There's the doors that have like the, the uh, Darkling symbol on them, which are a little bit too much. Uh, there's the doors to the guards' quarters where her, her people are going to be. Um, and it's a pretty big space, too. There's like rows of bunk beds. And they talk about bringing on extra people to be in the guard. But they just don't know who they can trust at this point. So they're holding off on doing that until they've sort of felt everybody out a little bit more to see where they stand on things. And I really love, Tamar says, what about some of the pilgrims? They're former military, and I bet a couple of them are good fighters. And Alino very wisely is like, first of all, the king does not like, we don't need the Sancta Alina thing being circled around in my immediate circle. That's going to make it seem like I like endorse that shit or I'm trying to usurp his position. Secondly, they think that I can rise from the dead. And I don't feel like if you think a person can rise from the dead, you're going to be quite as motivated to make them safe which was a really good point that I found rather funny. Um, so she tells them to look into having the roof fix, but not make it too perfect. Scars make good reminders. Um, and she asks the tray, she asks the servant to bring trays. And when the servant raises her eyebrows, Alina sort of curses herself for not being like, bring us some trays of dinner. Because she says, how does she word it? Will you see about trays? And it's just sort of a wishy-washy. It's too polite. It's too like, can you do me a favor? Rather than asserting, I am in command of you. And you do what I say. And I'm not worried about whether you're following my commands. Because of course you are kind of thing. 
And I agree with her. I, I think that that is something that she's going to need to embrace further. Um, so she looks around the room. She's getting a, a like, she really isn't loving being in the Darkling's room. The whole thing just is odd to her. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to, like, sleep in this bed. The, it's just all weird. And all of a sudden, she hears her name. And she sees the Darkling standing on the other side of the bed. And she notices that his face is unscarred and perfect. Interesting. And she keeps telling herself, this isn't real. I won't scream. It's a hallucination. There's nothing here. It's a hallucination. Don't scream. I won't scream. He will, he'll try and touch me and his hand won't pass right through me. And he says, you cannot run from me. And his fingers touch her cheek and she feels them. And he's like, fuck. And she brings up light in response and he vanishes. But right outside, all of her guards saw this huge blaze of light and come in like, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? And she has to say, oh, um, nothing. It's just, it's very gloomy in here. I was trying to brighten the place up. And Tamar finally, like, they stare at her. And then Tamar's like, yeah, you may want to think about redecorating. But Mal, the other two leave. He stays and is like, you're shaking. What's going on? And she keeps telling herself that she should call him back and explain everything to him. But she can't do it. She's just... I think she's just afraid he's going to think she's losing her marbles. I think she's afraid she's losing her marbles, you know? So let me go into chapter 14. Um, she wakes up remembering that she's in the Darkling's room and it's just like, God damn it. I really just do not want to be here. She steps outside and Tolia and Tamar are standing blocking a group of Grisha from coming right into her room. They are having this fight right outside. And honestly, the audacity, they were just going to walk up into her bed chamber with her asleep in bed. Are you serious? I am so glad that she has these two. Good God. So she asks what's going on. And Sergei says, this is unacceptable. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's right, said Fedyor. The Corporalki are the Grisha's first line of defense. We're the most experienced in military affairs and should be more fairly represented. And it turns out that they are all irritated about the fact that they are not getting the kind of representation at the War Council that they believe they deserve. So the Corporalki believe they should have more than just the two that everybody is being allowed. Each Grisha order gets two. They are all arguing that they should, they're more important, they should get three. Maybe, maybe, maybe four. Just saying. And she isn't, she finally, like, she says there will be two, no more, no less. Sergey starts to argue with her. And she's like, not only that, Y'all aren't going to be seated separately anymore. You're going to have to sit mixed. And also, the fabricators are going to need combat training. I know that this is not something that we have done in the past. And y'all are arguing about tradition. But guess what, kids? Shit's changing a lot. So you can either keep the fuck up. And we won't die because we refuse to fucking adapt. Or we can shrivel up because we're idiots who cling to things for no reason and wonder why you wouldn't just sit next to somebody at lunch while you're getting your fucking throat cut. How about that? And <laughs> this moment, I love this so much. Um, 
We're at war with an ancient power beyond reckoning, and you want to squabble over who sits next to you at lunch. This is the way we're doing it, I said, rapidly losing patience. No more corporalki snobbery, no more etherealki clicks, and no more herring. And I was laughing about that. Um, so they stand there for a second, and then finally they just leave, and she realizes that they're doing as they're told. And Nikolai walks in at this point, and it turns out he's been listening to the whole thing right outside the door, and it's like, hey, nice job. I do think adding the herring into the decree was maybe a little bit of a left, but you did pretty well on the delivery. And she's like, yeah, you know, you all of your advice depends on me being like, really suave and kind of aloof. And that's just not really working out. So I've decided to go with angry and short tempered. And that appears to be doing the trick. Hey, if it works, it works, you know. Um, so Mal comes in and sees her dining with Nikolai and is real weird about it. And he says he calls Nikolai Prince Perfect. Nikolai says, I've had a lot of nicknames, but that one is easily the most accurate. And tells her that he is inviting her to a ball. And let's see. No, he says, I've come to issue an invitation. Mal says, is it to a ball? I do so hope it's to a ball. He says, no, there's a hunt leaving tomorrow. And I would like you to go. Uh, my parents are not quite ready to let me out of their sight. And I've spoken to one of the generals and he's agreed to have you as his guest. And Mal is like, all right, wait, so you want me to go off into the woods on this boar hunt while you stay here with Alina? Do I have that right? Is that what you're saying? And Alina's like, on the one hand, Mal's right. What are you doing? But on the other hand, that ploy seems so obvious. I can't imagine Nikolai was trying something that, uh, like, that clear and easy to see through. Come on. And this is when Nikolai says, you know, for two people with a love eternal, you're awfully insecure, Nikolai said. I loved it. Some of the highest ranking members of the first army will be in the hunting party. And so will my brother. He's an avid hunter. Uh, and you need to make yourself useful. I am trying to equip the first army with information and gather intelligence. Word has it. He's entered the Sikurzoi, which are a mountain range that runs between Ravka and Shuhan. He, Nikolai says, I would have thought he'd be more likely to ally with Fjerdens, but the Sikurzoi are a good place to hide. If the reports are true, we need to forge an alliance with the Shu as fast as possible. And Alina's like, wait a second. So you want to like, if you think, if he is where you think, you want to like hit him there in the mountains? And he's like, well, if we know where he is, why not? Otherwise, what else is he doing but waiting and biding his time as he continues to grow in strength and come at us when he's good and ready, which is not what we want. And then he says, there's disturbing news coming out of the first army. I've seen it seems a number of soldiers have found religion and deserted. They're taking refuge in the monasteries, joining the apparatus cult of the sun saint. The priest is claiming you've been taken prisoner by the corrupt monarchy. And my father doubled the price on the apparatus head. You can see why it might be wise for the captain of your personal guard to start forging alliances within the Grand Palace. And that, Oritsev, 
is how you can be of use. As I recall, you wrote, you rather charmed my crew. So perhaps you could pick up your bow and play the diplomat instead of the jealous lover. I'll think about it. Good boy, said Nikolai. And Alina's like, fucking Nikolai, Jesus Christ. So Mal gets up and leaves. And Alina's like, dude, why do you do that? Why do you fucking poke and prod at him? Come on. It's just, there's no need for it. You guys are supposed to be on the same side. What are you doing? And Nikolai is basically like, what? Me? And she says, if you lose Mal, you lose me too, you know, so you may as well fucking behave yourself. And he says, Mal needs to learn what the rules are here. If he can't, then he becomes a liability. The stakes are too high for half measures. And then comes an interesting moment where Alina compares him to the Darkling. And he's like, oh, you mean the guy who tortured you and tried to kill Mal? I am not like that. And she says... Are you so sure that you wouldn't if it got you closer to what you want? Are you sure you wouldn't walk me up the gallows steps yourself? And Nikolai starts to talk and stops and then goes, Oh, God, I really don't know. And seems genuinely upset that he can't give her an easy, quick answer. He realizes she has him dead to rights. Like his priorities are a bit twisted at this point. And I like the fact that she managed to fucking nail him with that. He's really just like, I didn't know that I even had that in me. But now that I'm being honest about where I stand, shit. Um, so, she kind of, instead of like getting angry, she sort of just like slumps and is like, well, shit. As she realizes that like, he's an ally, but he's not somebody that she can really depend on. And he realizes he sort of added himself and he gets up and is like, look, I am ambitious. I want what I want. But I really hope I still know the difference between right and wrong. If you decided that you wanted to leave, I believe that I would just let you go. But I would really be sorry to see you go. And she sits there kind of thinking over what he said. And, you know, he doesn't sound entirely confident about it. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um... So then we go to the scene with Bagra. This is a terrible thing. Oh, God. So she had uh, asked one of the maids what's going on with Bagra. She, it, you know, she had found out that she was alive, but the maid doesn't really want to tell her anything and seems extremely like unnerved at being asked. And she knows that Bagra is probably her best chance at going up against the Darkling because that's her son. She knows him better than anybody. And she got close to like helping Alina escape him and is on her side. She tried to help me when no one else had, and I knew she was my best chance of solving the riddle of Morat Sova's third amplifier. And she goes to this hut and there's a, a little servant boy there dressed in gray. And I was very curious if this person is of any consequence, but I don't know. And Bagra keeps her back to Alina for the beginning of their conversation. Um, she asks, what did he do to you? And she hasn't seen her face yet. Bagra says less than he might have, more than he should. You were meant to disappear. Alina says, I tried, 
And she says, no, you went hunting. And what did you find? A pretty necklace to wear for the rest of your life. Come closer. I want to know what I bought for my trouble. So she turns around and Alina is absolutely startled. The worst of it is that Bagra's eyes are just gone. And there are like shadows in the depths of the sockets, writhing, as she puts it. Which I wonder if the Darkling is able to see her through that. That feels like he left a portion of himself behind. I am very concerned about this. I assume it doesn't really matter that he knows where she is by now. The news has traveled. But I don't know. That feels like there's something going on there. And also, aside from her eyes, she has just aged hugely. She's bent and withered and the strength that had been in her is gone. And even though she had always been elderly, she was, she held herself with a straight back and was very sort of, you know, it was, there was a strength to her still and it is gone. So Bagra feels the collar and sort of is like whispering about how she would have liked to see the stag for herself. And then Alina grabs her hand and puts it on the other amplifier. And she says, what have you done, girl? This is a weird moment. So when she says, what have you done? Alina takes that as confirmation that Bagra knows exactly what it is that she's touching, that she knows what this is and that she knows about the other amplifiers. So she thinks that this is going to lead to Bagra helping her. Bagra says, is it true that he can give life to shadow? And she hunches her shoulders when Alina says yes and tells her to get out. And Alina says, but I need your help. And she says, I betrayed my son once. What makes you think I would do it again? And Alina responds, I thought you wanted to stop him because you wanted to save Ravka. And he's like, why? She says, why the fuck would I give a shit about Ravka? I wanted to keep him from becoming a monster. But it's apparently too fucking late for that. He's out here pulling shit out of the shadows, live things. That's it. He's past redemption. Too late. Um, and she says, your only hope in this whole thing was to run. You decided to stay and go find your fucking precious little amplifier. We're done. I don't know what to tell you, but I am absolutely not helping you. I am not interested. And says, I want all I want now is a warm room and to be left alone to die. And Alina says, I could take all of that away. Maybe you'd feel like talking then. And as she says that, she's like, why the fuck did I just say that? Oh, my God. Like, she has a real moment of just, holy shit, what is happening? And Bagra tells her, oh, look at you. Really liking that power. It just seems to suit you all of a sudden. You are adapting really, really well to it. Go ahead and find that third amplifier. See what happens. They, they weren't meant to be put together. This is more than you can handle. You're changing already. You see yourself changing. If you get this third one, you're going to completely lose yourself. If you want to accept my help, my help is telling you to drop it. And Alina says that she can't and will not do that. And Bagra says, then do what you want. I'm done. I'm done with this life and I'm done with you. 
And she runs up out of there and is very close to crying when the servant boy outside says that his mother says that she's a saint. It's just too much. Um, And she realizes how completely devastated she is that Barbara doesn't want to help. She didn't quite realize how much she had to been depending on this old woman to give her information and to support her and train her and help her out. And now realizing that it, it, she had expected to be mocked a little bit by Bagra, but she didn't expect Bagra to despise her. And the fact that she threatened to take things away from her after being like blinded and suffering the way that she had just disgusts her. And she's like, Kind, she is blaming herself. I don't really, I understand Bagra's position because she doesn't know what happened. But honestly, she's saying, I wanted him to become, to not become a monster. And the thing is, I don't know if Alina didn't go after the stag that he wouldn't still have turned into this monster. He was catching up with her. You know, Alina was like, She had some head start, but she didn't succeed in adequately hiding. So I feel like the Darkling was going to catch up with her inevitably. And it was only then that she decided to search for the stag because it would be better for her to find it than him. And I don't really think it was just like the power that she was after. I think she was reacting to the knowledge of what he would do with it if he found it. And... I don't know. So Bagra's like, obviously, genuinely suffered. I'm not blaming her or saying like she doesn't have a right to be angry. But I feel like she's putting this at Alina's feet when maybe Alina doesn't entirely deserve it. Um, so the chapter ends that chapter with uh, Alina sort of wondering whether she's right about all of these amplifiers and the fact that they are sort of like influencing her um had bagra the the, let's see to do um i stood up and brushed the dust from my kefta i wasn't sure what had shaken me more bagra's refusal to help or how broken she seemed she wasn't just an old woman she was a woman without hope and i'd helped to take it from her Uh, don't entirely agree with that But what can you do? So we go to then chapter 15 and they are in the war room. I like the fact that she has to admit that she really likes it because she used to work on the maps and everything. Um, So it's something that really kind of gets to her personally on a level of, you know, the aesthetic and the craftsmanship ship and everything. Um, And... She has Mal sitting on one side of her and Mal, like right next to him is Sergey. And Sergey is very salty about the fact that he has been placed next to a guard who isn't even Grisha. He really does not like that. And on her left is a fabricator. Her left is considered a real position of honor. And it turns out that what she's attempting to do is rotate in and out different Grisha so as to not continue perpetuating this elitism that has sort of existed amongst the Grisha. Um, and she, it says the first part of the meeting was spent discussing the numbers of Grisha at the various outposts around Ravka and those who might be in hiding. Zoya suggested sending messengers to spread the news of my return and offer full and free pardon to those who swore their allegiance to the Sun Summoner. We spent close to an hour debating the terms and wording of the pardon. I knew I would have to take it to Nikolai for the king's approval, and I wanted to step carefully. Finally, we agreed on loyalty to the Ravkin throne and the Second Army. No one seemed happy with it, so I was pretty sure we'd gotten it right. Um... And then they talk about the apparat and what to do about him. Everybody's sort of a, 
like surprised at the fact that he has still managed to avoid being captured. And they have spotted him a couple of places. And he apparently will show up out of nowhere to preach and basically like sort of poach soldiers. And Sergei is like, dude, he's probably colluding with a darkling. He's out here trying to fuck shit up. We should just kill him. And Alina's kind of like, good God, I can't believe that we're just discussing murdering this guy this casually. Like she knows that this is part of the deal, but she's still not used to it yet. You know? Um, and Fedyor says, let the king do the dirty work. Let him find the apparatus and execute him and let him suffer the people's wrath, which I think is a better call. Fedyor's right. They can't have him taken out without it looking like it's the Grisha who did it. And there are too many people afraid of the Grisha already. It needs to be an ordinary person that does it. Um, I wasn't, and she says, I wasn't sure I wanted the apparat dead. The priest had plenty to answer for, but I wasn't convinced he was still working with the Darkling. Besides, he'd given me the story Sanctia, and that meant he was a possible source of information. If he was captured, I could only hope the king would keep him alive long enough for questioning. Zoya asks, do you think he believes it, that you're a saint and risen from the dead? And Alina says, I don't know if it matters. And they're like, mm, yeah, it does matter. We need to know if this guy's loopy or if he's a fucking zealot, because those are not the same and they will result in very different motivations. So if we know that, I think that does make a big difference. Um, and this is when Alina notices Zoya who's like glancing over at Mal all the time because Mal's super hot and she wants to bang him. Um, she was a p powerful squalor and potentially a powerful ally, but she'd also been one of the Darkling's favorites and that made her difficult to trust. Who was I kidding? I hated even sitting in the same room with her. She looked like a saint, delicate bones, glossy black hair, perfect skin, all she needed was a halo. And this is when she's like, I think Mal's trying too hard not to look at her. So then they, they, she decides to tell them all about the Nikivoya, the fucking shadow creatures, because she isn't sure that they really get what the fuck they're dealing with here. And Paja says, you escaped, though, so they have to be mortal. And she's like, my power can destroy them, but I have to use the cut to do it. And that is a draining thing. I don't know how many of them I can handle at once. And the Darkling, the only reason that we held him at bay when Nikolai got us out of there was because we were out of range. And I don't know that's the thing, like... That's apparently their main weakness is being too far away. But they are not susceptible to like just sunlight the way that you would expect. A regular bullet, a regular blade, they do nothing. So we were a mile or so out of range and then it seemed there that we were too far but i mean a mile and she also adds it costs him something it's not like when we use our grisha abilities and that is what keeps us strong and strengthens us he's weakened by it for some reason when he summons them and david says that's because it's not grisha power it's mirzost in Ravkin, the word for magic and abomination was the same. Basic Grisha theory stated that matter couldn't just be created from nothing, but that was a tenet of the small science. Merzost was different, a corruption of the making at the heart of the world. That energy, that substance has to come from somewhere. It must be coming from him. How is he doing it? And he, she's sitting there kind of like letting everybody talk it over. 
And she's wondering because of the way that David looked at her when Zoya asks about other Grisha, the, the, she says, excuse me. Um, I wondered what he might know about Moritzova, and I wanted an answer to Zoya's question, too. I didn't know if I had the training or the nerve to attempt such a thing, but was there a way to summon soldiers of light to fight the Darkling's shadow army? Was that the power the three amplifiers might give me? I meant to try to talk to David alone after the meeting, but as soon as we adjourned, he shot out the door. Any thoughts of cornering him... In the materialki workshops that afternoon were squelched by the piles of paper waiting for me in my chambers. I spent hours preparing the Grisha pardon and signing countless documents guaranteeing funds and provisions for the outposts the Second Army hoped to reestablish on Ravka's borders. Um, Sergei had tried to manage some of the Darkling's duties, but much of the work had simply gone unattended. And she says everything seemed to be written in the most confusing way possible. And yeah, that does seem like how that shit goes. I can't tell you guys. I, for a little while, I was doing this podcast where I was reading through bills that were coming up in the Senate or the House and making calls to my representatives live on the air to give people an idea how to do that sort of thing. And some of these bills, man, it was baffling absolutely baffling what the fuck side they were on the way they were worded and they would purposely be done that way you know to obfuscate what they were really trying to accomplish it's so frustrating um so she goes and sits down at dinner and she's been trying to do that like cycling people in and out um but is having a hard time because she's not like naturally at ease with people she isn't charming and charismatic the way that mal is so the conversation is just incredibly awkward and uncomfortable however she's a little bit buoyed by the fact that nobody else seems to be doing all that much better like when she looks around the room everybody else seems to also be having an extremely awkward time since they're being sat next to others who they don't really view as being of similar uh, hierarchy and whatnot. Um, I made a silent count, 40 Grisha, maybe 50, most of them barely out of school. My glorious reign was off to a miserable start. So the next day, uh, she's thinking, cause Mal is about to leave for this hunting party. And she says she had lain awake the previous night Remembering the way Mal had kissed me, wondering if I might hear him knock at my door. I debated crossing the common room and tapping at the guards' quarters, but I wasn't sure who was on duty, and the thought of Tolia or Tamar answering made me prickle with embarrassment. In the end, the fatigue of the day must have made the decision for me, because the next thing I knew, it was morning. So I still don't know if these two have had sex yet. I don't think they ever have, but maybe they... Uh, I don't know. I don't... Hmm. I feel like if they hadn't at all, that would have been made more clear. So I, I assume they have at some point. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so she gets up, goes outside to say goodbye to Mal. Uh, and she really is like laughing at the size of this hunting party and how completely like overdone everybody is he's wearing rough spun and in comparison with like the fucking the silk and leather that everybody else tends to be wearing he just stands out like a sore th thumb um and when she comments on it mal is like oh this isn't even all of them there was another group of servants that left before dawn to set the camp up so that way, when we want a pot of tea and we arrive, it will be all ready to go for us. There's like so, oh, I wish. Um, and <laughs> she's saying goodbye and there's they're telling Mal it's time to go. And she suddenly feels really awkward because she wants to like kiss him goodbye. And she has to be, you know, discreet. I wanted to fling my arms around him, bury my face in his neck and make him promise to be safe. But I didn't. And he bows to her 
and says, Moi souveraigne, and leaves. And she watches him go, and it's just like, mm. um, And as she heads back, she is talking uh, with Tamar about the fact that they have known each other since they were children, and, you know, the, just the relationship about the way that it's, like, grown between them, you know, that it, it's just, that gives it a different dimension. Excuse me. I keep, like, having these little bubbles. Um, and they go and see Botkin, who was the one who taught her how to fight. And I love this so much. Botkin says, oh, you're not so little anymore. I can hit you the same, uh, even if you are a big girl now. And she's like, oh, well, how very nice of you. Very egalitarian. And they sort of like hustle on out of there before he fucking starts some shit, because he's probably kind of bored right now. Um, we went to the Grand Palace to join Nikolai as the king's advisors briefed him. It felt a bit like we were children who had intruded on the adults. The advisors made it clear they felt we were wasting their time, but Nikolai seemed unfazed. He asked questions, uh, careful questions about armaments, the number of troops stationed around the city walls, the warning system that was in place in case of attack. Soon the advisors had lost their condescending air and were conversing with him in earnest, asking about the weaponry he'd brought with him and how it might best be deployed. And I like that, that he just plows on through and he knows that eventually if he's continuing to ask thoughtful questions, they can't help but be interested in responding to him because this is their whole job. So, you know, the key is to just not let it get to you. Um, and he tells her later that they will come around in time. That's why you need to be there to reassure them and help them understand that Darkling isn't like other enemies. They and she's like, well they have to know that. And he's like, mm, they don't have to is the thing. They're not up against him yet. They have to once it's time to face him. And by then that's too late. We need them to know now before they have to, they don't want to know it right now. And she sort of has some like sympathy for that situation. She's like, mm, I would rather not know either. Um, so, he takes her down to the lake and tells her that he wants to construct a pier so that he can start rebuilding the hummingbird again. And when she sort of laughs about the fact that he's so uh, restless, he says, Alina, I'm hoping we can find a way to defeat the Darkling. But if we can't, we need a way to get you out. And she cannot believe her ears. She's like, and what about everybody else? And he says, there's nothing I can do for them. And she's like, oh, I can't. You want to just run and abandon everybody. Are you kidding me? And he's like, look, I would rather go down fighting, honestly. But I don't want my parents left to the darkling's mercy. So give me a couple of squalors to train to protect them. I don't know. And she says that they're not gifts, which I do appreciate. But in a sense, she kind of does have to start treating them that way. Like a little bit, you know. Um, and he tries to reassure her that he does still think they can win. And she says that she's glad somebody does. But the fact that he has like an escape pod essentially prepared. I mean, I think it's very prudent. I approve, you know, I, but that's my way. I like to plan for everything. I like to be prepared. And she just thinks it's incredibly shameful. I don't know, though. There might be a situation in which... <sighs> You're glad that's there. I'm just saying. So anyway, that is the end of the chapter. So, oh, Jamie was here. Jamie, I had the book in front of my face the whole time. I didn't even see you. I'm sorry. I wasn't ignoring you. Um, But she's gone now. 
But yeah, so again, thank you very much to Joanna for commissioning this. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the coverage. I'm very interested to see where this goes, because at this point, I don't really know what to expect. So we shall see. And I will see you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast. Yeah.